What's up, kittens? Hello, hello to all of you. Today is day two because it's September 2nd of 30 that I am doing my best to come on here and talk about what Operation Unbothered is and how I have continued to implement different strategies, um, different content that I have been coming across, um, really focusing on A Course in Miracles to really describe this uh, quantum leap that I've done and how I'm maintaining all these different aspects of my life. Um, today, I definitely am excited because, well, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm, I'm laughing as you can see, because I'm thinking in my head, what I'm about to say is, I don't know if necessarily it's a fun topic uh, for everyone uh, to talk about forgiveness. And something that I have really, really been working on the past three years is forgiveness of myself, forgiveness of others, and forgiveness of society um, while here in this dimension. And um, I'll be looking off to the side a little bit because I set up my notes on my laptop. Like I said yesterday, I'm not really sure how I want to progress. This is all new. This is super fun. I'm in this uh, creative moment in time of I'm just seeing how this goes and seeing what I like to do and what I don't like to do. And yesterday was a little hectic with <laughs> notebook, a book, the computer. So today I was like, let me just see, put everything on the computer and see how this goes. So I'm going to start off with principle number 16 from A Course in Miracles that states, miracles are teaching devices for demonstrating that it is as blessed to give as it is to receive. They simultaneously increase the reserve of strength in the giver and, lol, I just realized I covered up most of the screen here so I can't see everything. Okay, all right. I'm gonna start again. Here we go. <laughs> Miracle, and yes, I'll be, I, I, just to share, like I am the type of person where I don't really like to edit a lot, like when I'm having these sort of, um, I like to call them the real world confessionals. I really only like to edit my vlog, so I do just keep most things in. Um, yeah, here we go, I'm gonna start over. Rewind, rewind. Principle 16 in A Course in Miracle states, Miracles are teaching devices for demonstrating that it is as blessed to give as to receive. They simultaneously increase the reserve of strength in the giver and supply the lack of strength in the receiver. I have forgiven you and that means all hurt and hate you have ever expressed is canceled. So essentially it's this idea that me as the giver I am equally able to harmonize that energy exchange as the person that I am forgiving. Um, and the practice of forgiveness has also been my permission slip for myself to unzipper my universe from other people that I feel are no longer a sense of fresh water in my life. Um, I can forgive, I can unzipper, and I can protect not only my boundaries, uh, my also my inner child, little A, and to do so with curiosity and ease and love that I'm making the best choice for my overall well-being. And even if somebody else is not necessarily wanting to accept that experience of the unzippering, it's okay. No wrong has been done. It is my choice. It is my prerogative. It is my option, one of my options that I have to say, I forgive someone and we don't, we no longer need to be in connection, energetic exchange with each other. Um, John Hopkins Medicine states, as you release the anger, resentment, and hostility, you begin to feel empathy, compassion, and sometimes even affection for the person who wronged you. Meaning that a forgiveness practice can provide both interpersonal with other people, energy exchange, and intrapersonal with myself, well-being and mental health benefits and just kind of thinking about all the different things that I've experienced in my life where forgiveness has ended up being the end result for me 
I'm grateful <laughs> that I even have these, this as a tool in my toolbox to be able to say, I forgive somebody and then able to move forward with my life. Um, starting off with forgiving myself, of taking radical accountability for harming myself, harming others, and contributing chaotic energy to the collective. Um, I am sober. I am. Em I embrace a sober living lifestyle as well as harm reduction, meeting people where they're at. So I definitely have no judgment for people who engage in any type of substances. For me, I just have experienced mostly through my 20s. Um, some very uh, interesting learning lessons for my universe where I, there was two terms in my universe that people knew, either Hong Kong or my alter ego, Leticia. And Hong Kong came about when um, I studied abroad where there were, I, most of that time I was literally blackout drunk. I, there's a lot of parts of that time that I do not even remember studying abroad because um, what was going on at the time is that there was a lot of free drinks going on. And when I had traveled, I had actually turned 21 in Hong Kong and I was not a drinker before that. Um, actually, I was typically the designated driver. You could always catch me in the club. I was drinking a pineapple juice and I was wrangling my friends when it was time to go. So when I left, um, and now I think that part of that even was as a coping, me coping mechanism of both the culture that I was in, a lot of the people that I hung out with um, came from other countries where the drinking age was not 21, it was much younger. So they had already had been um, exposed to a more, well, some were exposed to a more harmonious, like drinking a glass of wine with dinner or having a couple of drinks out, not necessarily what I was doing, which was just binge drinking, um, dancing on bars, uh, throwing up everywhere, just wreaking havoc wherever I went. I did not have a sense of control. It took me a couple of years even after my returning from studying abroad to know what my limit was. And because of different, well, that just feels like an excuse even internally. Um, I just, even though I knew my limit, I didn't respect my limit. And that's where um, the forgiveness for myself came in of abandoning my own self-awareness and safety. And also um, where Leticia comes in is that I would get, everyone loved being around me when I was dancing and partying and being the life of the party. There was always that one drink that would push me over that Leticia would come out and then I was ready to like verbally assault everybody. Um, typically whoever my partner was um, or who invited me out because for whatever reason, which I think this goes a lot back to my codependency and my abandonment wounds that I'm, I have worked through and continue to work through, that I was like, oh, I'm just going to go hamon and just drink, drink, drink and do whatever. And then the responsibility is going to be projected onto somebody else. So for myself, um, forgiving myself for manipulating situations through my codependency and towards others for assuming that they were going to take responsibility for my well own well-being, when in reality, that's my responsibility. So for me at this time, I, and quite frankly, I am the type of person who does not drink alcohol anymore. I think that there's also a lot of other things going on with alcohol in general in this current culture that um, supports people being, um, I'll say sedated, essentially, and also allowing, um, I do find it curious that alcohol is also called spirits. And I know that for myself, like when I would get blackout drunk, I don't know all the things that I did. It was as if someone else was taking over this bodysuit. And I take radical accountability. Like I was the one that just kept drinking. And internationally known as being a hot mess and putting people in myself in some very, uh, I would use the word dangerous and precarious situations that I have worked through. And I'll share a little bit later of ways that I have forgiven myself and forgiven others. Uh, really just accepting that my I had really, I did not make good choices and who I am now I'm thankful and grateful that I was so divinely protected during those times in my life 
that I was able to now be able to be here at this moment and say like, this was my experience and I've been able to compost that into I think being a very strong peer supporter because of my lived experiences and also really embracing the harm reduction lifestyle and f uh, framework of how I approach not only my myself and the things that I engage with also other people who may or may not choose to have alcohol or other substances in their life. Um, also another thing that I have been working on and this is like a more continuous thing because this is a major area of growth for myself and self awareness and self actualization of that at 29 I had taken a 23 me DNA test and I realized that I was actually half European well 60% European and 40% from the African diaspora and that was something that I had no idea about growing up it was just something that was not talked about and when I re when I found out about that um it was one of those moments where the universe was giving me the opportunity to put into action my forgiveness tools. And I really needed to, I, I, cho I took, I didn't need to, I chose to forgive myself that I didn't know all of who I was, all about me um, and allowing that be, and, and recognizing that that was a part of my own spiritual awakening from the spiritual amnesia of, all the lessons that I learned in the first 29 years of my life, what the knowledge and gosh, I have like just so much knowledge now that like happened from my uh, growing up that now as an adult, how am I integrating this new knowledge, this new uh, dimension of, of me, of who I am. And also forgiving all of the caregivers in my life as well of, if they did know, not telling me, and if they didn't know, not asking more clarifying questions. And really just forgiving myself for that experience and knowing that no wrong has been done. And I'm so grateful that now I know because it has really allowed me to, um, it's given me an opportunity to connect with my ancestors in a different way and to learn and my whole universe was expanded with that one test that those those results and I'm grateful for that experience because quite frankly I just feel like I have been able to just explore so much more about who I am and do so with a very curious mindset and in 2020 the same year that I found out about um the DNA test, um, I was also introduced to the Sam Harris uh, Waking Up app, which is, I highly suggest uh, and recommend this app for supporting uh, getting into a, a solid meditation practice as he has a lot of courses on there and he also has something that it's a progressed um, learning tool of how to meditate uh, where he is guiding and and supporting with that process, which I really feel like that gave me a strong foundation of what is meditation, how to meditate, and then being able to explore other types of meditation rather than just his guided meditation. And through his app, I actually came across um, John Cornfield's uh, Meta Loving Kindness. It's either Meta Loving Kindness or Loving Kindness Meta Meditation, where this is uh, the the lines uh, and this is adapted may I be filled with loving kindness may I be safe from inner and outer dangers may I be well in body and mind may I be, be at ease and happy and really just allowing that be to be a foundation of forgiveness and love fresh water being poured into me and the thing I really enjoy about this meditation is that it can also it also goes from may I may you may we so that sense of the self kin uh, kinship sonship other people and then the collective as a whole and for me forgiveness has provided me with the space and grace for myself and others to be able to observe different experiences without negative emotions such as anger fear hostility contempt and to really be able to reflect on these different experiences that the universe has provided me to be able to show up and be the person that I say I am and be in alignment with my most highest self. Forgiving others.
Um, <laughs> it can be challenging. In the beginning, for me, it was challenging. I, I did not, I was not as cool, calm, and collected as I feel right now. I, I was experiencing and have experienced a lot of rage and a lot of anger and fear and abandonment and disdain for people who I thought were there to protect me when really going back to even what I shared yesterday about no wrong has been done of people were just playing their part in the experience to allow me the opportunities, these checkpoints to be the person that I say that I am. And even if I didn't know who I was, or even if I was saying I was something, giving me the opportunity to say like, oh, do I need to pivot? Because maybe like going back to now living a sober lifestyle of my choice used to be alcohol to cope. Now, and, and the universe kept giving me opportunities, uh, lots of free alcohol was, uh, opportunities were in my life for a good portion of my 20s. Um, to be able to pick something else to do or to even just be able to still go out and uh because i love house music and i love to dance of still being able to go out and, and know that i don't need to have alcohol to go out there to dance like in my teens i never drank well i don't want to say never because there was a few times that i did, did i did try like a little sip of a beer here and there which didn't work out well um however the point of that is that giving myself different options. Like I can change my mind. I can choose to do something different. I can choose to pivot and change. So for me, forgiving others really can't, is coming from the point of view of people are just doing their, their job in my universe. People are showing up in my universe for the ways that I am needing them to so I can learn my lessons and vice versa. I'm showing up in people's lives so that they can learn their lessons because there's a lot of people who didn't have to take care of me and they did take care of me and that's their you know that's their experience to process and go through of why did they take care of me why did they um i almost said the word i was going to use the word allow um why did they choose to be in those situations and again no judgment just a question because i don't know all i can say is i think it's I feel that it is because people are put in each other's lives for the lessons to be able to continue to grow. Um, Queen Amara says that karma is neither good nor bad. It is just a reciprocal energy exchange. And last year in particular, uh, Queen Amara is a tarot reader on YouTube. And last year when I was going through my major spiritual awakening that has put me that put me into a timeline that has allowed me to consecutively get to this timeline of essentially she was saying like, why kick somebody when they're already down? If, if someone's already experiencing a tower moment, if somebody's already experiencing extreme emotional distress um, or the, ob the uh, me as the observer is seeing something that is like not, making the math isn't mathing there it's not making much sense who do i think i am to send negative energy towards that person when they are having this experience and that really was a major pivotal point in my uh in my own forgiveness journey of being like yeah why would i kick somebody when they're down i know what it's like to be in situations where i'm feeling helpless or discouraged or just being like what in the actual heck is going on and to think that people would be sending intentionally sending me negative energy and that also goes to the responsibility of other people of watching their thoughts of being able to not send negative energy and if they are sending negative energy being able to cancel that and be able to reinstate positive energy so for me having that um, that seed planted in my mind of how to treat people who are having these experiences and are sending me perhaps negative energy, just really being like, I can observe the secular and see what's going on. And I choose loving kindness and blessing people and, and sending that energy to them. 
And for me, I really do, I have seen the math equation play out where I have had the uh, options. I've had a lot of options where I could have been that person kicking other people down when they were down and, and being self-righteous and saying like, you're deserving of this negative energy because of what, what I have perceived that has been done to me without except like because for me like if I'm if I'm saying that no wrong has been done then there is no space in my universe for that negative energy all I want to do is bless people is cover them with prayer cover them with love cover them with protection from whatever they're experiencing um yeah and for me I just peeking at my notes I wrote being kind is free and doesn't clog up my own energetic field with resentment, retaliation, or hostility. And I have to live inside this bodysuit. I am connected to this mindset. I am connected to me and my higher power. And I'm trying to do what I choose to do and be the person that does whatever I need to do to maintain in divine alignment. And not leading with a love-focused, love-first mindset is in direct contradiction to the person that I say that I am. So therefore, if I say that I'm the type of person who le leads with a love first mentality, then I am going to choose love and that is not kicking somebody when they're down. Um, a Course in Miracle says, letting go of our false perception that another sinned against us and deserves our anger and thereby releasing that person from the guilt we had laid upon her. Forgiveness is then the recognition that there is nothing to forgive. No wrong has been done. All of this is um, a tango, a dance, where the energy exchange is moving because at the end of the day, in my universe, I believe that all souls, all bodysuits here are fragments of source. So really, if I start being in a negative, non-love first uh, mindset towards others, I'm really only hurting myself because if I am you and you are me, and if I am projecting it onto you, then that is going to be projected, projected back onto me. And I don't want that. I'm over here. I want to be living a peaceful life. I want to be living an abundant life. I want to be living a blessed life, which I live all of those things. And that's where I was saying, like, the math has worked out where I know that I have blessed and poured fresh water onto people who, perhaps in the secular mindset, could have riled up resentment, retaliation, or hostile, or, or hostile feelings inside of me. And I just said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to continue to bless these people because at the end of the day, I would want that to be done to me. I would want people to send me loving kindness. I would want people to send me the ease and flow and love and light to make it through whatever it is that I'm experiencing. Um, my current forgiveness practice, uh, in addition to the loving kindness, which I'll be honest, I don't do that one as much because I've really been diving more into this, these two things. Um, the first thing is cord cutting. And then the second thing, which I hope I'm going to say, not butcher this too much. So I'm going to take my time. The O Opapono meditation and prayer. And this popped up, this kept popping up in my universe. And then I finally, within I guess like the last couple of weeks, really was like, okay, I want to integrate this into my daily morning routine. So how can I do this? And if you're not familiar, it is um an ancient Hawaiian religious prince rewind. It's based on ancient Hawaiian religious principle and a prayer practice for forgiveness. And there's four lines. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And thank you. So it's taking on, it's being love first, taking radical accountability, asking the other person for forgiveness, opening up that communication energetic exchange, which in no means do I mean that has to be in the 3D secular that could also be in the 5D multidimensional. And thank you. And for me, I just love that it has the thank you at the end of just that acknowledgement of being potentially being receptive on the other end. And also just being in gratitude. 
Um, there's been many peer studies that have actually shown the impact of this prayer to be successful at changing energy and behaviors at others through the process of changing the perception of that person. Um, one of the most famous uh, peer reviewed articles or yes, articles, I will link it below, is by Dr. Hugh Len, who used this prayer to influence the behavior of patients in a psychiatric ward. Um, and he had minimal contact with the individuals and was using their patient files to um, go through this particular meditation. And the results were that the secular behavior of the patients completely changed after a couple of years. And that was done through him, Dr. Um, Hugh Len, changing his perception of how he was viewing these people and then their behavior was able to change. And I would say like using a behavioral uh, science term, the latency there, depending on, I, this is just a, a hypothesis of mine of, I would say that depending on whatever I'm experiencing and, and how deeply rooted um, a potential judgment that I have for other people, I think that would determine on the latency, the time I'd start the prayer or start the forgiveness practice. And then the latency is the time in between to then see the results that I'm hoping for or that I'm desiring. So I think that in the sense of this taking a couple of years for the process to really take hold really depends on where the person is coming from and what is it inside of me that I need to really work through so I'm not projecting that onto other people and then seeing that reflected back, which that also ties into um, Neville Goddard, uh, everyone is me pushed out of what I am internally feeling is what I will externally see mirrored back to me. Um, and then in the mornings, I what I did was I love index cards. And uh, so I have a lot of them that like support me as visual aids in my morning routine. So I actually have a index card that just has like names on it along with the four phrases. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And I go through the name, I, I say their names, and then I go through the four, and then I just take a little moment, and then I move on to the next person. And honestly, I'm feeling like energetically fluid. I feel really good. I am really grateful that I am able to implement. And something that I am actively working on now is not that if I'm having a non-love focused thought that comes through my mind, whether that's judgment or anger or uh, jealous or envy, I'm able, because there's these are four lines that I've now memorized, I'm able to actually in the real time, if I'm having that thought, I can just say these lines. And I think it's really been helping me and whether or not the other person is experience, I don't know what these other people are experiencing. For me, I know that it is giving me a new sense of groundedness within my highest frequency because I feel like this practice is giving me the opportunity to step outside of my lower frequency secular self based here in the 3D and really just coming from a loving kindness perspective. Forgiving society. Neville Goddard says in The Feeling is a Secret, you will rise believing that you are a free agent, not realizing that every action and event of the day is predetermined by your concept of self as you fell asleep. Your only freedom then is your freedom of reaction. You are free to choose how you feel and react to the day's drama, but the drama, the actions, events, and circumstances of the day have already been determined. When I first started listening to Neville Goddard, um, through the way, by the way of uh, Kim Velez, I was like, what is he talking about? What is going on? And the more that I listen to his work, I'm just like, whoa. There, it is like a blueprint in my opinion of how to engage with the energetics of this dimension. Um, more recently, I was watching uh, an, another Aaron uh, Dowdy, 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 uh, video that was talking about the multi-dimensional impact of the atomic bomb. And I found this really curious because I re literally within the same week, I had seen the movie Oppenheimer, which is about J. Robert Oppenheimer, quantum physics and the atomic bomb, and also the 
um, impact. And the movie really only focused on the secular dimension impact of what happened in Japan of the atomic bomb. And I thought it was really interesting that the that I had called in this particular video because it ended up talking about how the atomic bomb was, um, let's see, what did I write here? That, oh, it overstepped the energetic boundaries. Let me adjust this. Overstepped the energetic boundaries. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Okay. Going for, I should just left it alone. I was trying to go for perfection and I bo boinked the whole camera. Um, it essentially overstepped its energetic boundary by not just impacting Mother Earth, rather it impacted the entire multidimensional uh, system of space and other universes. And Aaron talks about in, the, in his video that that moment in time ended up being a call for help for Mother Earth for souls from other universes to actually come here to be light workers, to be miracle workers, to come here and restore the extreme imbalance that was created. And yes, I did actually use the uh, Ho Opopono meditation for Oppenheimer and the people that um, were a part of that in Los Alamos because I, I do feel, and I'm gonna share, I'm gonna go into this in a moment, that that is an, one, one example of people in power utilizing the, how do I wanna say this? Miscreating with the tools of this dimension and multidimensional tools to bring something that was very egocentric because at the end of the day the atomic bomb that whole movie talks about just essentially how Oppenheimer was not wanting to push science to be used as a as a weapon rather using it as first just like being able to experiment with science and see what could come up and then it kind of snowballed into this much larger thing that ended up becoming the atomic bomb and there's a lot of points in the movie where Oppenheimer literally was like again this is a movie so Hollywood it's like take what resonates leave the rest however I was really feeling and then lo looking into a little bit more about um him and his wife Kitty afterwards that there was a lot of Conf inner conflict of creating this this bringing this math to the dim this dimension and then seeing it be used to essentially murder many people so the question always for me is well who's who the radical accountability is that everybody has played a part past present future of that moment in time so now here i am in the future sense of that moment in time of what can I do to can to kind of rebalance and recalibrate that experience? Um, yes, I realize I say um quite a bit. It's something that I'm working on. Just close my mouth and read my notes. <laughs> um, yes, so Aaron talks about how the atomic bomb, the detonation of that, is a was a call for people to essentially be put into the game of the game, the life, game of life, um, and do our, do the part to save it as best as possible. And in my opinion, the atomic bomb is an example of the promotion of moral flexibility for the instant gratification of the person, organization, groups in power. And in this case, the American government's ego to attempt to remain a superpower over all their countries at the expense of civilians, Mother Earth, and scientific morality. And another example, which I love sharing this uh, documentary, which is on YouTube, um, is The Century of Self, which is an Adam Curtis documentary coming out of uh, the BBC, where this promotion of moral flexibility is at the influence of capitalism and the consumer's mind. Uh, one of my favorite quotes during that time period is from Henry Ford, where he essentially says, like, you can have any color, so 
any color model T so long as it's black, which I think is a ominous, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of the word. It starts with a P. I'll say premonition. I don't think that's what I'm looking for. An ominous premonition of this sense of where corporations are dictating based off of their point of view, their supply chain, their preferences of programming the consumer's mind of what is available. And one thing that's really interesting about that documentary is that Edward Bernese, who is Sigmund Freud's nephew, utilized the psychoanalytics that Freud affirmation alarm, I am a fiscally responsible, fully resourced adult that is responsible for my action, reactions, and feelings, which is interesting since I'm talking about forgiveness here. I'll get back to it. I'm just adding these extra details that I wrote. Um, I was talking about Edward Barnese and how he used Freud psychoanalytics to essentially influence and create what we now know today as public marketing um, to change the consumerism, change the mind of the consumer to want to buy, buy, buy in order to maintain this secular dimension sense of ego worth. And I'll, it is what it is. You know, this is, it, it's another example of when things that are created or come into fruition in this dimension cannot necessarily put it back what uh what is it uh, you can't put the toothpaste back in the in the toothpaste container and i think that's this is a major example of that um between the atomic bomb and and even uh modern day consumerism of using these these skills science and tools that create something that is just way bigger than people really could have even projected um and being in my highest frequency now um, has allowed me to be an observer of the secular dimension through reflection, participation, and integration. And I'll say it right now. Yes, I am manifesting a Range Rover Defender. I love those cars. I think they look like stormtroopers. Um, and that's one way that I love to play with dope cars, luxury cars. Um, I'm also non-judgmental of people who do agree that about dope cars and who do not agree. Because uh, there's Again, even within that idea, there's a lot of content to really digest the impact on the environment, the cost of it. Uh, there's houseless people. There's people who don't have any food. You know, there's all these things that can be unraveled that can either support or discredit that desire. Yet it doesn't change the fact that I am a person who likes cars. Um, and I also consider myself to be an educated consumer and after healing from my own emotional shopping as a coping mechanism and now being able to have a balanced purchasing power in the secular world, I know I can acknowledge all of those different aspects of what does it mean to be a purchaser of a Range Rover Defender. Uh, circling it back, and like I said, to the forgiveness part is forgiving the ongoing program of this secular behavior, consumerism, envy, jealousy, social media, low self-esteem, consumption. Uh, I added here, unlike Lindsay Lohan's revelation in Mean Girls, the limit does, ex does exist for the stress and expectation of the secular dimension to attempt to satisfy the insatiable black hole of external validation through things. that is something to ponder within your own universe of what is the meaning of things? How many things does somebody need? What type of things to be in this dimension? I don't know. I can only answer for my own universe. And all of these experiences continue to contribute to the collective mass programming and awakening from their spiritual amnesia. Same, same, and different. These are just, it's just another dimension of life that provides an opportunity for people to show up and be the people that they say that they are. And are you an educated consumer or are you asleep and just going along with the flow? I don't know. Again, that's a self-reflection for yourself. And then I wanna, I'm gonna wrap up all of this forgiveness talk with uh, cord cutting and celibacy. And on my journey of the past year of being consciously single, I have intentionally cut the cords for all past relationships. 
snip, snip, cut them. And also have asked Source for the support to cut the cords for not only the known relationships, the unknown relation, energetic ties, um, to fully embrace my own healing and receiving of my own divine purpose partner. Because as I mentioned before, now I'm living a sober lifestyle. I spend a lot of time in my 20s blackout drunk. There are things that even to this day, some people are like, did you know that you did this? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I did not know that I did that. Because I have my own memories of things that I did. Puking on a table at a restaurant that I actually really, really liked. Um, peeing on the side of a house. Uh, there have been many taxis that I have thrown up on, thrown up in, uh, just like mayhem. And again, due to my lack of self-awareness and self-accountability at those times, because I was not there to clean that up, somebody had to do that. So for me, asking forgiveness and, and taking that radical accountability that, no, that was not cool for me. Like, I do not subscribe to that behavior anymore. And I'm thankful that I made it out of those situations while also acknowledging that that's not who I am anymore. I have evolved from that. And I'm not ashamed of those experiences because it is something that as a peer supporter and I'm able to share my story and say that, yes, I had this experience and there is a way to compost those moments and decisions to become a high frequency vibing individual without judgment, without shame, without guilt. It is what it is. And again, no wrong was done. It's that process, that dance of having those experiences to be the person that I say that I am. And I am no longer a person who throws up in taxis. Thankfully, I'm grateful <laughs> for that. Um, okay, cord cutting and celibacy. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this because there's a lot of people on YouTube and out in the social media sphere that are, are that will talk about celibacy and be like, well, why are you telling people that you are celibate? And then being like, you should tell people. And this is literally the reason why I'm sharing this. When somebody is engaging in um, a sexual relationship with somebody, that is connecting energetically, not just in the secular world, in the multidimensional sense of the word of connection with other people. And then all of the people that they've engaged with. And then it just exponentially grows. And for me, I no longer want it to be uh, six degrees separated from the entire world. So it was very important and very intentional that as I was going through, as I can, was starting and going through this process, that I was not engaging with other people. And also, if I'm saying that I'm the type of person that is consciously single, then for me, that includes not, that means being single, being on my own, not engaging in any sort of energy exchange in that sense. And I've had this conversation with a few people recently and energetically people are not aware that it is becomes a burden. It becomes a connecting glue. And for me, as I continue to quantum leap, where I was last week, where I was six months ago, where I was last year, where I was in my 20s, is not where I am today and not where I'm going to be next week and continuing on. I'm continuously quantum leaping and up leveling and expanding and changing and getting to know myself even more as I become more and more aligned with my divine purpose. And for me, people of my past, grateful to them for being a part of my experience, I no longer am zippered to their universe. So if I'm no longer zippered to their universe, I want to let them go in love and gratitude and joy and not have any residual energetic interference with where I'm going. I don't wanna be tied down, tethered down, cement shoed down in other times of my life because of the fact that I am still energetically connected with someone because I didn't cut the cord or getting, re getting attached to somebody new because I am ha being sexually involved with them. I'm not interested in that right now. So for me, I take I see celibacy as a strong boundary to protect my energy because truthfully speaking, there have been a few of my past relationships where it has taken 
a good amount of time for me to disengage with their energy. And honestly, it's tiring. I've, I've been tired. It's exhausting. It takes a lot of effort. And the thought of re-engaging and opening that up with somebody who is not a divine partner, no. I'm not interested. No, thank you. And again, coming from the non-judgment, I'm not judging anyone. If, if people want to, if people feel empowered to go and have multiple sexual partners, just know as an educated consumer that now that choice has now connected somebody with somebody else and that there will need to be work to be done to cut that cord. And depending on the trauma bond, the type of connection that is there, it's, it doesn't always just take one cord cutting ceremony to release people. It There have been people that I've had to do this continuously multiple times, I'm talking like 10, 12, 15 times to really solidify that their universe is not, they cannot get into my universe anymore. So for me, the celibacy is a way to say, you do not have a key to come into this universe. The vetting process is still happening. And also I'm not interested in having to do the legwork afterwards for that instant gratification. Uh, let's see, let's see, as I wrap this up. Overall, the process of forgiveness is for me. Finding ways to genuinely forgive from a multi-dimensional standpoint without expectation from another person. Without expectation from another person. That is why I love the act of forgiveness. I do not need to get a permission slip from another person to unzipper my universe from their universe. And it does not matter if they still want to be connected to me. I get to choose who is connected to my universe. And through the act of forgiveness, cord cutting and letting go, I can maintain who's on that VIP list because not everybody's on the VIP list. I don't have the bandwidth. I do not choose to engage in the ways that I have done before as a recovering codependent where I let everybody come on over because I was seeking that insatiable desire to be loved, accepted, and not abandoned essentially. So I am I love that. I don't need other people's input. It is something that I can choose to do on my own. It is a practice that I can do it for myself. And, and being love focused, love first minded, I can say, peace and love, I'm letting you go. And don't even have to say it in the 3D because there are many people in the 3D that I will, unless the universe decides it, I am not manifesting meeting with people. I am very much, um, as Brittany, the cosmic intuitive wife, he says, uh, the cutoff game is strong. And it is. I will cut people out of my universe, unzipper from them, if I do not think that they are able to pour fresh water into my life. And I am at peace with that. And I'm okay with that because I, one, know that I'm not for everybody. And two, I know that not everybody's for me. And what a gift because being in my divine purpose, I got a lot of things to do. And it's not being uh, muddled here in the, in the secular dimension with individuals who may not have the self-awareness to, to not pull on my energy. That will be a video for another September day, I promise. Um... And lastly, I would say that forgiveness has a high ROI, return on investment in the form of absolute inner peace. Because like I was just sharing, I don't need permission from somebody else to forgive them. I don't need permission to, um, be, to be forgiven. Yeah, to either forgive or be forgiven. I am just able to incorporate this practice into my life for myself, to others, to society. And keep it on, keep it on in the best way possible in my highest aligned reality. And I'm really grateful for that because this is a, stra a strategic and strong tool in my toolbox that I am able to call on daily if I need to and know that for me, the result is inner peace. And I'm telling you, I have the most peaceful life and I'm going to keep on keeping on with that. With that, everybody, this has been super fun. I'm so proud of myself for showing up for day two. I look forward to for day three. And I want to wish you a grand rising, grand evening, and a great evening wherever you are. Wait, did I just say evening twice? 
grand rising, grand afternoon, grand evening, a great rest of your day wherever you are, and I will see you tomorrow.